John Calvin called the family the fountainhead of mankind. Uh, and what he meant by that was that uh, if, the, if the bond of marriage was broken, specifically in society as a whole, uh, that society would eventually decay. It's kind of like he was saying that, the, that marriage was the heart of society, and, and if uh, the heart was, was forced to stop, then eventually the body would, it would die. The body would die. Uh, and we're living right now in an era, and I don't think there's anybody in here who would disagree with this, where we are, are living out Calvin's warning. We're wit- witnessing the empirical data to our right and to our left about the death of a society because of the death first of the home. The divorce rate in California, and even in the U.S., is among the world's highest. In fact, there are now 2,400 divorces in our country per day. And that's one every minute, which means that as we sit here, by the time we're done, there'll be, have, have been 40 more people that will have, have decided to break apart what they had covenanted together before the eyes of God to, to hold on to. In our nation today now, three out of five children who come out of divorced homes feel rejected their entire life. Statistics show that the ramifications and consequences of divorce go on an entire life. There's no end. There's no terminus. And young men are growing up now, and they, they struggle to, to be independent. In fact, they have a hard time holding down a job because they, when they were in their early years, saw such brokenness and lack of commitment. Young women, the next generation, are, are, are jumping relationship to relationship, trying to, to fill their insecurity by sleeping with men, an insecurity that began when they saw their, their father leave their mother. An estimated 1.5 million U.S. children are now homeless, and in the prison population, 90% of the men in prison lacked a father figure. So if you really want to push your child to be a criminal, simply leave your wife. Uh, And sadly, Western culture now promotes an anti-family sentiment. I was reading this last week that GLAAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance um, Against Defamation, uh, they're saying now that a reported 12% of TV characters are LGBTQIA. And then in November, Disney is going to release, apparently, their very first show called Strange World that that brandishes a gay teen romance for, for children. And there's even a new national campaign, I'm sure many of you have heard of it, called, in quote, the drag queens for every school. And maybe you've seen the pictures of these, these men that are dressed up, these transvestites parading through libraries with third and second and first graders looking on and then receiving candy from them. Movements like BLM. Uh, who supposedly are all about an, in quote, social justice, we talked about that recently, uh, have as a part of their core values uh, an anti-family rhetoric, what they call we're anti the heteronormative patriarchy, end quote, which simply means we're against the nuclear home. And pornography is an epidemic. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago, people said, well, COVID's a pan- pandemic. Pornography is the pandemic of the Western world. Studies now are being released by secular agencies saying, get this, that 98% of men in the country acknowledge some use of pornography within the last six months. That 70% of women acknowledge some use of pornography in the last six months. And then you move that over to the evangelical world and still 68% of men and 43% of women say, yes, I've been involved in pornography in just the last six months. In fact, the average age... For pornography hitting the eyes of a child is age 10. And many children now as young as four or five are having the very synapses of their mind burned, which is why as they grow up, they're not able to ever view another human as anything but meat, a tool to be used for pleasure. And it's a frightening day 
when Kanye West is becoming your voice of reason? Come on now. I mean, when conservatives, end quote, Christians are turning to Joe Rogan to be their voice of reason, you know your society is collapsing. And it's not just that Western culture is promoting an anti-family rhetoric. Now Western politics are legislating an anti-family rhetoric. I mean, the Democratic Party platforms openly LGBTQIA as the societal norm for life. And the Republican Party is not far behind. Have you looked at the numbers? There are lawsuits across the country right now coming from parents at schools because without any kind of consent from the parents, entire jurisdictions or, or schools are actually teaching children to transition their gender. There's a Canadian bill recently that has removed the, the right of the parents to decide who their children hang out with. And you know what's really frightening for us sitting here in Orange County is that California is leading the way in a lot of that. Did you guys see last Tuesday Governor Newsom signed 12 bills? Bills promoting and pushing abortion. One of them even saying that now a coroner does not have the right to investigate the stillbirth, the death of a child. Meaning that if a mother or a doctor goes in and just rips the legs off of that baby and leaves it in the dumpster, no one has the right to even investigate it. And then he had the audacity to put out billboards around the country using the very words of Christ to say, we want your business, America. Young ladies, come to California, 16000 a year, and we're going to cover the murder of your children. You're not just watching a, a social push against the family. You're watching an ardent sociopolitical push against the family. They're trying to literally rip the home out from underneath each one of us. That's what you live in. That's what you live in. It's an assault on the core institution that God gave mankind. And to quote Calvin, if you lose the heart, you're going to lose it all. And we learned last week that this isn't the first time Remember the church at Corinth? They were going through it too. Marriage was botched, family was botched, and they were saying, Paul, should we just quit on the whole thing? Should we just divorce our spouse and stay celibate or stay married and not touch? Should we just be single and forget it all and be a monk and move to a cave? Because it's that messy. And you'll remember that Paul said, simple principle, being single is a gift, And being married is a gift. Remember that? Now what we're about to find this morning as we continue on in that study is he says, I'm going to apply that particular principle four ways. And by the way, friends, each one of us in the room is a part of one of those four groups. Nobody gets out. So today, this morning, everyone's in on the sermon because everyone's in on Paul's writing. So if you have your Bible, open it to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you would, with me. And let's jump right back to where we were, where we ended last week. We got through verses 1 through 6, which dealt with uh, marital faithfulness and, and marital romance. We talked about how a husband will always elevate his wife and take care of her needs, and the wife will take care of his. Uh, and then Paul moves to these four groups. And he says being single is a gift, being married is a gift. But then he says... Here's how you apply it to your condition in life. And so if you got a pen, I'm going to go ahead and throw these up really clearly on the screen so you can see them. Number one is simply going to be all of you who raised your hand earlier who are single. The single believers, okay? Look at verse 8. Here it is. He says, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows. So that's really a generalization there. Just kind of general terms for the bachelor, the bachelorette, the divorcee, the widow, anybody who's single. He says, what I say to the the single people, 
is that it is good, it's fine for them if they remain even as I. Now, you guys all know Paul by this point is not married anymore. He probably was married. He's part of the Sanhedrin, so he would have been married and probably he got converted and she took off and said, no, I'm Jewish. I don't want anything to do with you, you follower of Christ. And so she took off and now he's single and he says, hey, it's good for you to remain as as I am. In fact, look down real quick. You can drop your eyes to verse 26, verse 27, verse 32. Again and again and again, he's going to say, it is good to be single. You can get a lot more done. There's a lot less distraction. And uh, single people, if you don't believe me, just talk to a married person and say, hey, is is it hard? And they'll say, hey, it has its moments, right? Now, very important, friends, if you have a pen there, you could just write this in the margin. Let me talk to the single people real quick. It's a helpful reminder, you ready, not to idolize marriage. That right there is a helpful reminder. Don't idolize marriage. Yeah, that's kind of an evangelical deal, right? The last 50 years. Everything's about marriage. And you come to church and we're all playing Cupid. I do it all the time with guys like Jordan and Alex and you know, I'm doing that. Hey, we've got to find you a wife, right? That's kind of the thing. Marriage seminars, marriage books. Your, your biological clock is ticking. We got to get it going. Come on now. What's wrong with you, we say. If you got to, get on eHarmony, we say. Come on now. And there's this pressure that begins to build. Any single people ever felt that? It's kind of like, man, everyone's forcing me to, to get hitched. All right? But some of God's purposes are done best by single people. Some of the greatest feats in all of Christianity are done by single people in all of church history. I mean, you think about a guy like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who we still read about. You think about a a, a lady, she was a short lady named Gladys Allward, and you read her biography, and some of you will remember, she's an English woman, she ends up in China, she's caring for the kids of the the orphanage, and then all of a sudden, Japan begins to attack, and she ends up trekking a hundred kids over the mountains and takes them to safety. You can't do that if you've got the encumbrances of a husband in the background going, well, don't you want to meet my needs? I mean, you've got to be all in for the kingdom of God. You've got to be all in for the church. You've got to be all in for those that are hurting to do something like that. What about Corey Ten Boom? Anybody ever studied her? Here's this lady. She decides or finds out by 40 she's probably not going to get married. She's helping Jews get freed from Nazi Germany out of Holland. And then she gets ended up thrown in a concentration camp and she ends up traveling the world telling her story. Why? Because she didn't have a husband in the background who was saying, don't you care about my needs? She was able to be on fire for Christ. I was reading this last week about a man named John Chow. I was so moved. In fact, we still have excerpts of his diary. In 2017, he was fired up to reach an unreached people group. So he ended up in India, and he went to a little tribe out on an island called the Sentinelese, and he kept little records because he thought they might kill him. And then his very last date of his journal was November 16th. He said, they shot me with an arrow yesterday, but the arrow from this little 10-year-old boy hit his Bible. So he said, I'm afraid tomorrow they're going to miss my Bible. And they did. He went canoeing out. The fishermen wouldn't take him. He got to the island. And then that was all that anyone ever saw of him because they they, they killed him. You can only do that if you're unencumbered. Gentlemen, is your wife going to let you go to the Sentinelese India tribe and go to the unreached people group and sit there and row a canoe over to the island and then take an arrow in the chest? She's going, no, uh Not on my watch, Buster Brown. You can only do that if you're single, right? I think about that. I I don't want to say any more or embarrass him too much. I think about that every time I leave the parking lot and I find out that Elijah Kim, you know, the guy who's doing the youth ministry for us, is over there studying until 2 a.m. in the morning. I mean, he's in the, 2 a.m. in the morning, and he's in there studying in the offices, studying seminary, getting ready for youth ministry, and that youth ministry just keeps growing. 40 students, 50 students, 60 students. He's pouring his life out to the kids. You can't do that if your wife's at home. I tried. Bree said, no. You come home now, sir. 10 o'clock, cut off. Remember? Last week. Some of God's purposes are best done by single people. What he's saying is that if you can be single, cherish that. Don't let people steal your joy. Don't let them pressure you. It's good. 
God gave you a gift and a special ability and you lack the strings. Now, some of you are going, well, no, I feel like a third wheel all the time. You know that weird feeling? Just own it. Own it. Find a couple, a great family in the church and tell them, you know what, I'm going single for Christ for a while. But I'm going to have to come over to your house once a month. I want to eat dinner with you. You, you, you be my sponsor family. Right? The Masaros will take you in. The Robins will take you in. they got 18 kids already. They'll take you in. And then you go ahead and you show up and you eat whatever pizza they're offering. You have your fellowship. Then you get back and you get focused for Christ. That's what you do. He says, listen, some of God's purposes are done best by us single people. And if you can be single, cherish it. But here's the key. Look at verse 9. But some of you can't do that. You don't have the gift of celibacy. See it in verse 9? If they don't have self-control, let them marry. Because it's better to marry than to what? What's your Bible say? Than to burn. See? And marriage there is aorist tense, meaning it's a single point in time, where burn is present tense, meaning it was the ongoing thing. He says, hey, you better find somebody and go ahead and get married because you're, you're burning. With what? With desire. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Some people go, well, I'm going to be on fire for Christ. I want to serve Christ. But then a beautiful, you know, a, a handsome man walks by and she goes, I'm on fire for Christ. Whoa, who's that? He says, that's not going to work, right? Because the way God wired you, you want that relationship. You want to be romantic. You want to be wed to somebody. And so real quick here, friends, let me just say this. What, what, what's implicit in the text is that if you have the gift of celibacy, you need to run. You need to run hard for Christ. But if you're here and you have a desire to be married, God eventually is going to bring somebody for you. He knows that. But until that time comes, you've got to be pure. And so if you're single, just write these notes down real quick. Let me give you a few takeaways, okay, just on how to be getting through the, what I call the burning single stage. So let me try to help all the burning singles. If you're a burning single, all right, I was there once. Ready? Number one, write this down. You, if you want the right person, you've got to be the right person. If you want the right person, you've got to be the right person. You know, don't, don't just always be looking for somebody be focused on becoming somebody for Christ. That is so important, friends. If you spend all your time trying to look, you're going to begin to idolize marriage, and before you know it, you're going to make mistakes that you, you never should have. A godly man is always looking for a godly gal and vice versa. See, there's this idea, and I'm going to be honest, I've got, I've got a teenage daughter, I've got a teenage son, I've been there before. There's this idea when we're single that we have to make ourselves look a certain way and then, then that's the way we're going to attract attention. Listen, friends, if you dress in a seductive way, you're going you're to attract seductive people. But if you're a godly man who's on fire for God, you're going to attract a woman who's a godly woman and she's on fire for God. And ladies, the exact opposite is true for you. If you want to find a godly man, be a godly woman. Because I'll guarantee you, the man who's on fire for Christ and going off to seminary isn't walking around looking for the little girl late at night in the miniskirt. He's looking for a woman who's serving, a woman who's loving, a woman who's pouring out her life for other people. And he's saying, I want to have a wife who will, who will run the river with me and, and go for the ride with me and serve with me wherever the Lord may take me. So if you want that kind of man, you become that kind of woman. And God will take care of the rest. So don't focus on looking, focus on becoming. Which leads to number two, don't do the long courtships. Don't do them. It's amazing. Young couples will meet at church and they'll be on fire. They're going to come down and they're so in love and they want to do premarital counseling with us. And I'll sit down, I'll go, hey, well, what do you want to do? Get married in three, four months? We can get through this quick. And they'll go, well, my mom and dad want me to wait two years. Two years? Well, yeah, they want to have a big wedding and all the great grandparents are going to come in, take the $50,000 and give it to them for their house and let them go get married next week and not burn. See, is that all the single people that are clapping or the mom and dad? Cindy just saved $50,000, right? Now, listen, very important. It's amazing that we would do that to our kids. Paul says they're burning, that's why they're getting married, then we want to make them wait two years, then they fall in sin, they feel guilty, and we wonder why they walk around a shell of themselves. Just let them get hitched. Let them get hitched. Young people, don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to yourself. Number, number one, you want the right, right person, be the right person. Number two, don't do long courtships. Here's another one. Channel all your energy into the church. You can't lose if you do that. You jump into a discipleship group. You go to that new Friday study with Connor. Every ministry, you're at it. 
When I was single, that's what I did. Every single night of the week, it was weird. I was showing up at the junior high. I was like 22, and I was at the junior high ministry, and they're looking at me, who's that guy? I just want to serve, man. I just want to be here. Wednesday night, youth ministry. Thursday night, college ministry. Friday night. I was always looking for a way to be at the church. I wanted all my energy to be going up to Christ and not out to, to my burning. Very important to understand that. That Madagascar trip that's coming up, you need to be on it. If you're single, why would you stay here? Why would you not be around the world serving? You get on the trip. Here's another one, number four. Don't envy your married friends. You go ask your married friends how hard marriage is, they're going to tell you straight up it's tough. Don't idolize marriage. If you idolize marriage, especially young ladies, here's what's going to happen. I say this with all tenderness. You're going to end up, a lot of Christian gals end up fornicating. They end up fornicating and doing things they swore that they never would because they believe that by doing so, that man's going to marry them, and that's just not the case. Don't idolize marriage. Here's another one. Program your mind with Scripture. Program your mind with Scripture. And what I mean by that is you, you pull out a piece of paper in your Bible, and you write down the 10 spiritual characteristics that you're looking for in a husband or wife. And I, I said spiritual not he's tall, and he's dark, and he's handsome, and then maybe a Christian. And not she's blonde and whatever height or whatever. Don't do that. Don't put down he's got to make 190000 bucks a year. Who is this man in the heart? And who is this woman in the heart? Write it down. And then when you come across someone like that, you say, Lord, I believe this is it. And when he gets down on his hands and knees and says, will you marry me? You say, yes, sir, I will. I've been waiting for you for five years. There's no doubt about it. The moment I saw you, I knew that was my list. That was my list. In fact, here's a book I brought up here. This is called The Art of Divine Contentment. This was written 400 years ago by Thomas Watson. Uh, and in the original, it's hard to read, but Jason Roth updated it into modern English, and it is good. And this goes married, single. If you're here and you're going, man, I struggle with discontentment. I always feel like I'm not quite satisfied. This book is gold, The Art of Divine Contentment. Go ahead and pick it up and program your mind with Scripture. And then, of course, here's another one. Flee every tempting situation. You're like Joseph. Joseph. God's single man and God's single woman isn't out on the town. You're not a cockroach like those other people. They're always out when it's dark. You're, you're a child of the light. You're a son of the light. You're a daughter of the light. You don't go out after 10 p.m. to go party. You get up early. You get in the Word. You, you do everything you can for Christ during the day, and then you go to bed. Now, some of you are going, man, that sounds really, really judgmental. Okay, you just go ahead and help me out here. Can you name one positive thing that happens after 10 p.m.? Come on, single people, tell me one thing you've ever done that was super positive and biblical and Christ-honoring after 10 p.m. See how all the old guys are laughing? Look at them. They're smiling. Get up early. Get in the Word. Serve Christ. Go all out and then hit the hay. Because if you're out hanging with the type of people who like to be out in the dark after 10, I guarantee you, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Your character and your company, they go right together. It's going to end up bad. You flee temptation. All right, single people, there it is. Paul says very simply, he says, it is good if you're single. You roll if you're single. You, you go ahead and serve Christ if you're single. But man, if you're one of those who burns with the desire to be married then you go ahead and get your heart right, you get your life right, and you pray and trust that you're going to have the opportunity to get married so that you don't burn with lust. That's the single believers. Now he goes on to the second group, the married Christians. The married Christians, look at verse 10. He says, but to the married I give instructions. Not I, but the Lord, meaning the historical Jesus. He says these were things that Jesus taught. Specifically, that the wife should not leave her husband. So if you're a married believer, you don't leave. But if she does leave, meaning she's already left him or he's already left her and they've been divorced, he says, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And then he goes on, and that the husband never send 
his wife away. Now, notice real quickly there, friends, the issue isn't how they got into marriage, it's that they need to stay in marriage. And you could picture them. I mean, in Corinth, they'd blown the whole thing, and they're going, man, we botched it, Paul, what are we going to do? Help us out here. We, we, we just would like to basically get divorced and go be celibate because we're tired of all the madness. What should we do, Paul? And he begins to lay down the parameters for the biblical parameters for a Christian marriage. In fact, if you have a pen, just go ahead and write down a couple of these. You ready? Number one, the general rule of Christ. This is the general teaching of the entire Bible. You ready? Is no divorce. No divorce. It's off the table. 99% of the time, we are going to fight for that wedding. We're going to fight for that union. We're going to love our spouse. Even if they've hurt us, we want to lay ourselves down. And we want to respond the way that Christ did for us. In fact, uh, turn back with me real quick, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. And look at verse 32. And this is an important passage. In fact, let me take you to two real quick. Matthew 5 and Matthew 19. This is where Jesus laid down the ground rules for uh, for, for Christian couples, uh, for those who want to honor him with their choices. And in Matthew 5, verse 32, we'll just read a couple of the verses. He says, I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife. Now, if you have a pen, you want to circle this word coming up here. He says, I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife. So any man or woman who gets divorced except for the cause of, now here's the word you circle, unchastity, pornea, any sexual sin, makes her commit adultery or he commits adultery. It works both ways. So he says, you stay married. There's no divorce. And then the only exception to that would be this, this sexual immorality. In fact, jump over real quick to Matthew 19. Here we go. Look at another one. He says the same thing a different way. You remember the Pharisees had come and they're arguing about why Moses would let people get divorced and Jesus goes back to God's design and in Matthew 19 verse 9 he says, and I say to you, remember Jesus is always taking the old teaching and ratcheting it up a notch and he says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for, here's our word again, immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So there's no divorce, there's no divorce. And many of you will know that he pulls actually from Malachi 2 where Yahweh had said, I've been watching Israel and you've been treating the wives of your youth with treachery. In Malachi chapter 2 verse 14, the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you've dealt treacherously. And then those famous words, God said, for I hate divorce, says Yahweh, the God of Israel. I hate it. What's happening in America? God says, I hate it. What's happening in the church? I hate it. You don't walk away. You don't give up. You don't give in. I hate it, he says. That's not what I want for you. So the general rule of the Bible, of God, of Christ, is that there's no divorce. In fact, if you jump back to 1 Corinthians 7, look at verse 11 Uh, He even gives a solution for those who've already done it. I mean, obviously, there's going to be people, they're sitting at the church at Corinth, they're going, well, Paul, what do we do now? We've already been divorced. And then in verse 11, he gives the parentheses. He says, then let her remain unmarried. You see that? Or be reconciled. And the idea here is that the couple had been divorced. Then they got saved. He says, you need to stay single or reconcile. And you can kind of see how that answers a host of questions we get all the time. Not every intricacy, but but a lot of them. You either, general rule, stay single or you try to fix it. You know, some of you may have come in right now and you're like, what do I do? I've been divorced. You stay single. Now that you're a Christian, you stay single and you serve Christ with abandon. You're all in. You count the cost or you try to fix your marriage, assuming they haven't moved on and and been remarried. That's just the cardinal teaching of the scriptures. You you don't compound issues. You don't go, well, I was in that marriage, now I'm going to jump into another one, then that falls flat, then I jump into another one, because what you have is consequences that are just following you for the rest of your life. He says, you don't do that. You don't do that. So the general rule of Christ is no divorce. Uh, If you've been divorced, you you, you stay single. If you're a Christian now and you serve, you serve. And then you guys all know this because we, we circled it, but the only exception to, 
to, to, to divorce is what? The only time you're allowed to be divorced according to Christ is what? Did you catch it? Sexual sin. Remember? Matthew 5.32, unchastity. Matthew 19.9 is what? Immorality. Same word, pornea. Just general sexual sin. When one person commits a sex act outside the spouse, that's not just a violation in the, in the union. God says it may actually break apart the union. It's okay for that to break apart the union. It's not always what we want. In fact, a lot of times in counseling, we would say, hey, you've been hurt, you've been harmed, but you stick it out, love the way Christ loved. He was hurt, he was harmed. And I've seen countless people do that in the middle of a massive amount of pain. And they said, I'm gonna stick it out anyway because I wanna, I wanna love selflessly. But that is an exception to, to the no divorce rule. It is an exception to the grievous. Uh, that, that is the exception, grievous sexual sin. Now, I want to pause there for a second and um, just have a pastoral moment with all of you. Um, I'm growing very, very concerned. In fact, I would even say my, my heart is beginning to ache. As I begin to think, and I have been thinking a lot about how some of you are about to lose everything in, in your life. And I, and, I, and, I, and I don't think that you realize it. But there are many of you, some of you in our church, you're about to lose everything in your home, uh, your kids, your pocketbook. Let me explain what I mean by that. There's a lie, and obviously it's the devil, and obviously it's the flesh, but also it's just true in evangelicalism now. And here's the lie, you ready? There's a divorce clause for, for adultery, meaning if I do it with my hands. But that doesn't count if I only do it with my eyes in pornography. And that's why week after week, people flood into evangelical churches and they acknowledge 70% of the males that they have a pornographic problem and yet they just keep showing up as if it's all going to be okay. But can I point out to you the word again that Jesus used? Pornea? Do you hear the root? And we don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have a first century example of this, so we have to actually use a little bit of logic here, but just think about it. Um, Paul and Jesus didn't have cinematography, and they didn't have photography. They couldn't have even comprehended. Paul couldn't have comprehended cinematography. So what would have been the closest that they would have had to, to modern cinematography? What would it be? Well, in Corinth, it would have been that there would have been a man who would have said, well, Paul, uh, in the evenings, I go down to a brothel, and then there's a sex show that goes on, some kind of sex capade, and I watch these people do these absolutely horrendous things, and I sit there, and I chug my beer while I gratify myself or whatever, and then I go home to my wife, who's just laying in bed, cold, calloused, insecure, and in tears. Oh, and by the way, Paul, I do that again and again and again and again and again every night, to the point that she knows I'm doing it, and I'm obstinate about it, and I don't really care. My heart is hard to her. Now, question for you. I really mean this. Would Paul or Jesus have said, oh, that's good. You're fine. You stay in the marriage. It's all good. Or would that have been considered pornea? And just because it's a 50 and 60 inch screen or a 12 inch iPad or a 6 inch phone doesn't change the truth of the principle. Do you get where I'm going here, friends? Thomas Schreiner, who is, is one of the most trusted theologians of the modern day, says, I'll quote him, yes, pornography constitutes pornea. Since the word designates sexual sin, then he asks the natural question we're all asking, does it qualify as grounds for divorce? He says, sometimes. Depending on God's wisdom, using pastors and elders as wise counsel to discern, not as a first response, but possibly an eventual one, end quote. 
See, the question that I don't think that we're wrestling through because pulpits are scared to say anything about anything anymore is whether many of us are about to lose our entire home because of the issue of pornography. Because here's the reality. There's only three possible groups in an evangelical church. There's some of you sitting in here, if the stats are right, and I pray to God that they are different at our church than others. But if the stats are right, that means there's only three groups. Are you ready? There's one group in here who is being purified from all of this, and you and your spouse are 100% transparent with each other, and you have cut off, to use Jesus' words, that particular sin. You have set up yourself on a flip phone. You don't have the television anymore, and you are walking in joy as a couple. And praise God for that group. Or there's a second group. And you have come clean, and you mourn your sin, and you hunger for righteousness, and you're crying out to God, and you're open with your spouse, and you're rushing to pastors, and you're sitting with biblical counselors, and you're in discipleship, and you're in accountability, and you're saying, I'm going to always come clean, knowing that if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive my sin, but I want to work on this, and I want to get better. I'm not going to hide it. But the group that scares me is the possible third one. That if you come to church week by week by week by week and you are enslaved to your sin, hiding your sin, deceiving your husband or your wife, it's only a matter of time till he or she walks up here, it happened first service, in tears. And you end up coming down to a counseling meeting with a pastor and acknowledging that this is a decade-long battle. And your wife says, I can't do it anymore. Your husband says, I can't do it anymore. And according to the words of Jesus, yes, losing everything is on the table. Fighting for a marriage is not just the battered spouse that's holding on for dear life. Fighting for a marriage is also the sinning spouse coming clean and doing what's right. Do you know what I'm saying? And saying, I believe so much in God's design for purity. And I believe so much in what I I covenanted to when I walked down that aisle and I stood in front of friends and family in the eyes of God and said, for rich or poor and sickness and health, I believe in that. So much that I'm going to come clean with my sin. And I'll do anything to make this marriage work. Paul deals with single believers. He deals with Christian marriages. And then there's a third group, this one. There's a lot of you here I've talked to who are in this one too. Mixed marriages. I can't tell you how many times the last year I've had this conversation. Your husband walks up, he's like, I'm saved now, man. I'm walking with Christ. My wife, she wants zero to do with it. And some of you guys come here alone while your husband or wife goes off somewhere on on Sunday morning. This is you. Look at verse 12. But to the rest, I say, not the Lord. He's saying Jesus didn't ever talk about this specific issue, but I as an apostle am going to lay out the groundwork for you. He says that if any brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she consents to live with him anyway, which by the way, we've got to pause there in a second and think about that. He gets saved. He's entirely different. She says, I'm going to stay put. He says, don't send her away. And then in verse 13, he flips it around. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, let her not send her husband away. And then in verse 14, he gives the reason for it. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified, that means set apart through his wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified, or hagiadzo, set apart or blessed through her believing husband. For otherwise, your children are both unclean, meaning they live in a pagan home. They got no shot, but now they are holy, hagiadzo, set apart. They are blessed as well. We'll talk about that here in a second. So the third group, I mean, that's some of you. You got saved. We've had those talks. And and, and the spouse, your spouse, you're saved. Your spouse is not saved. And the Corinthians were simply asking, well, should I just ditch him? Makes sense. Think about it. Every Friday night, your wife is wanting to go off and party with the pagans and then bring all the temple offered idol food back to the house. And you're going, dude, I'm a Christian. I want nothing to do with that. Paul, can we just call it quits? 
It's like the old Puritan saying, if you're a child of God married to a child of the devil, guarantee you're going to have trouble with your father-in-law. Did you get that? Think about it. <clears throat> Friends, it's true. One of the most heartbreaking things as a pastor is when a man or woman comes up and they're trying to walk with Christ and meanwhile they have to go on for six days a week, seven days a week, and then get made fun of and get pummeled for their faith. Paul says you marry a believer, but for those of you who ended up in a marriage that's mixed, he says you don't, get this, you don't seek separation. You stick it out. So long as the unbelieving spouse is willing to stick it out, you stick it out. <laughs> now, can we just have a moment? Put that in the modern, the Corinth we go, okay, Corinth, whatever, but put it in the modern world. Will you with me? Can you imagine what it's like to get saved and then, well, actually, let's flip it around. Can you imagine what it's like for an unbeliever to be sitting there when all of a sudden the spouse that they knew changes entirely? Put it in real life. Sunday mornings, what did you used to do before Christ, before Jesus? What you used to do? Slept in. What did you do this morning? Now, just imagine that right there. Husband's like, what are you doing? It's 6.30 in the morning. I got to get the kids up because I'm going to be with the people of Jesus to sing songs. <laughs> he puts his pillow over his head, right? What are you doing? You know, the alarm's going off. It's a, we're both Christians. My wife and I love Jesus. We give our life to this church. We still, I still have a hard time when her alarm goes off 15 minutes earlier than mine. Can you imagine? She jumps in the shower and she's singing praise songs. He's trying to sleep. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. You know, and it echoes throughout the whole house. Get the kids up. Johnny, Sally, come running out. And they're putting on all their little dresses and they're running here to church. They sit around the table and they do their prayers and their devotions. And all of a sudden, all the money they used to spend on parties, she wants to spend on churchy things and churchy people. Lost all the party friends. Now they got churchy friends who say thee and thou all the time. Every night around dinner, she wants to spend an hour talking about Bible stuff. He grills her and hits her hard with all of his old manipulations, and she's sitting there going, that's okay, honey. I want to be a virtuous vessel under the love and temperance of the Holy Spirit for your accountant good. And he's like, who are you, woman? Can you imagine? It happens all the time. There's a couple in our church. Wife got saved just a couple months ago. I can tell you right where they sit. She was, she was floored by the Lord. I mean, literally broken. She, she was born again on her carpet. She's got some neighbors who are Christians in the church. They were ministering to her. She, she falls to her face, and she's just laying there, and Christ saves her. She gets up. The joy of the Lord starts radiating off her. She starts bringing her two kids here to the church every week. Her husband's just looking at her like, who, who is this? All of a sudden, one week, guess what I saw? There he was. He's just looking at me. <laughs> she came out of a cult. She was in a, like Jehovah Witnesses. Now she's in here. She's on fire. She's ready to love of Christ. And he's just sitting there. Two weeks later, he's looking at me and he's smiling and nodding. <laughs> Month later, he walks up. He's in tears. I just, I just, just, just don't understand. A month later, I believe. See, that's what he says there in verse 14. Look at it. For, look at this, the unbelieving, this is why you stay put, as hard as it is. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy or sanctified. See, there's four different uses of that word sanctify in the Bible. I can give them to you real quick. Number one is a positional sanctification where the Holy Spirit, you know, places you, baptizes you into the family of Christ. Number two is a progressive sanctification or being set apart where you slowly become more and more like Christ. Number three is a perfected sanctification, which means you one day will be glorified and you'll actually be like Christ. And then number four is what we would call here a privileged sanctification where just being around the people of God gives you the blessings of Christ. It's a spillover. 
And what he says here is that when there's a believer in the house, that whole house in God's purview is viewed as a Christian home. And the blessings of God pour out upon it. And those kids have opportunities spiritually they never would have had in a thousand years unless that parent stays put. What that means, friends, is that if, um, if there's one Christian in your home, it's a Christian home in God's eyes. He looks at it and he says, my blessings are on that home. And he's going to use that parent, he's going to use that parent in mighty ways to touch the rest of the home. In fact, finish it with me here. Let's go and do one more and then we'll be done. Look at the deserting unbelievers in verse 15. So we have the single believers. That's some of you in the room. We got the married Christians. That's a lot of you in the room. We got the mixed marriages. That's a handful of you in the room. And then he finishes, this is a real simple one, with the deserting unbelievers. This is the unbeliever who wants to go in verse 15. He says, yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave, let him go. The brother or the sister, that's the Christian, is not under bondage, meaning they can go on and get remarried, it's okay. But God has called us, now here's the key word, to peace. You let him go, because then you're going to have peace. You're not going to have the turmoil and the fighting anymore. For how do you know a wife whether you'll save your husband? How do you know a husband? You know, people always say, well, if I hold on, maybe I can save him. No, don't fight. Don't fight. Just let him go. And God will decide what happens to his soul. See? And that word peace is huge. There's so much in the Bible about peace and the blessing of the Christian life, the gracious life, the non-tense life, the content life. That's what Christian lives are supposed to be. And let me go ahead and just point out too there, friends, on that last one, that that's God's goal for a home, a home that's immersed in Christ and therefore it has peace. That's what you should have. That's what you should have. Christian homes should have peace. <clears throat> you know, that's why our, our home is a no-divorce home. Uh, it's just no divorce home. There's not going to be any divorce. We don't think about divorce. We don't talk about divorce. Furthest thing from our mind is divorce. You know why? It's not because of date night. It's not because of romance. It's not because of flowers or love poems, although I try to do those. Roses are red and violets are blue if if I don't write a poem a week, I still love you. <laughs> I, question. <clears throat> Do you think that poems and marriage seminars and, 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 and Valentine's Day flowers is really going to be the thing that's going to hold a 50-year marriage together through the trials of life. Yes or no? no. All right. So, 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 so who does? Christ. Christ does. See, our, our, we're not no divorce home because our entire life is, is about Christ. We just, we're slaves of Christ. We, we got these big teenagers rolling around this little condo. I want them to see Christ. We want to be a glass house, a fishbowl to all of you, so when you bump into us, you, you see Christ. We're, we're slaves of Christ. You know, beauty is, here's Christ, here's you guys as a couple. If you're slaves of Christ, the closer you grow to Christ, then the closer you also grow to who? To one another. If you want to have a beautiful marriage, a loving marriage, a great marriage, become a slave of Christ. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. So hopefully you get all this. Chapter 7. Paul says, whatever gift you have, you're single, use it for Christ. If you're married, use it for Christ. In fact, you can go through each of those categories again. If you're single, good. Use it. If you're a Christian couple, good. Stay put. If you are an unbeliever, uh, if you're married to an unbeliever and he wants to stay or she wants to stay, good. Let him. And if you're an unbeliever or married to an unbeliever, sorry, who wants to go, good. Let him go, and God will ultimately bring you, you peace. And see, what's happening is, is the world is constantly going after the family, going after the home, trying to chisel it away and pull it apart. And the Christian is the one who fights for the family, and he does whatever they can to always hold it together. Mm -hmm.